Good. So I think we can get started. Um, I see the uh, background the slides are running. Uh, but very briefly, thank you for uh, being part of the Force 11 annual conference. If you are just tuning in, we have a fantastic program. Uh, coming up, two uh, sessions of lightning talks and then some further sessions uh, this evening. Uh, as you see here, a few items of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we are running the sessions through Zoom. Um, we are going to obviously ask the speakers to, to, to talk, etc. everybody else, uh, this uh, room, uh, sorry, Zoom uh, meeting setup. So we'll just keep people muted until, again, we open for questions. We are recording the sessions because we are planning to make the recordings available after uh, uh, the conference. And again, you can find the program on SHED. And if you have any questions about the code of conduct, do uh, go to our website. It has information around that. The main thing is we want this to be a positive experience for everybody. So if there are any concerns, do check the website. It has information as to how to raise any issues. Uh, I'm Irache Puebla. I'm part of the 411 conference uh, organizing committee. And I'm going to be chairing this session where we're going to be hearing about uh, five fantastic uh, projects in the community. Um, each talk will run for around 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to uh, suggest that if you have any questions at any point, you use the chat functionality so that we can come to the questions when we open uh, for all of the presenters at the end of, of the talks. This is to make sure that everyone has uh, time to present. So again, if you have a question at any point, do feel free to add uh, during the, the presentations on the chat and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end and we can address any questions that you have. Um, okay, so without uh, uh, further ado, I'm going to invite the first presenter for our session today, uh, who is uh, Esther Plum. Esther is the data steward uh, of the Faculty of Applied Sciences at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. She's an open science enthusiast, and I know this. I've, I've crossed her in different projects. She's doing amazing work in the open science space, and she's going to be telling us about one of those uh, projects now. So, Esther, over to you. Thank you so much, Eric, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am currently in a hotel, so I hope my internet connection is holding, fingers crossed, otherwise there's a recording. Um, but today I am going to talk to you about a manifesto for rewarding and recognizing team infrastructure roles. And I, before I start, uh, I am involved in a lot of projects, but that is only possible because there's a lot of other people involved. And so on this slide, you can see an amazing team of co-authors, uh, which together we wrote this manifesto for rewarding and recognizing team infrastructure roles. And there's a link to a preprint, which we're currently updating for peer review comments. Uh, and I put a link in the chat so you will have access to that as well. And there is also a link to the presentation in the chat and in the slides on the right hand corner. And before I uh, talk about uh, rewarding and recognizing team infrastructure roles, I thought it would be handy to first tell you what team infrastructure roles actually are. And on the slide, you can see a lot of names of roles of team infrastructure roles. I'm not going to list all of them out, uh, but I think particularly relevant uh, for you would be librarians, program managers, data managers. Uh, and I have highlighted data stewards in particularly uh, because that is my role at TU Delft, uh, as you've already heard. Uh, so I'm the data steward at the Delft University of Technology. And next to that, uh, I wanted to highlight some of the other projects I'm involved with, uh, such as the Turing Way, Open Life Science, and a disciplinary specific data repository called ISOARC. So if you're interested in that, um, please feel free to reach out as well. And in these roles, uh, I sometimes come across texts or experiences that I wanted to highlight to you today. Um, and sometimes I wonder whether I am still a researcher as a data steward. And so, for example, I've encountered the text, the board usually selects people who have completed a PhD 
conduct independent research, and have at least a handful of first author articles. Uh, so I've completed a PhD, I have a couple of first author articles, um, but do I really conduct independent research if I am not actually generating any data? And then the next one is saying, is an active researcher. And I assume they are not talking about my physical activities. Um, but again, I am not necessarily generating any data. So am I an active researcher? I'm not sure. And according to the guidelines, the main applicant must be a researcher. And I have actually received a formal rejection letter for that one, uh, telling me that, no, you are not a researcher. So these are a couple of experiences that I've had. And if I'm not a researcher, what am I then? So our team of uh, co-authors came up with the term team infrastructure roles, uh, shortened to tiers. And what we mean with these team infrastructure roles are those who contribute to the research process, uh, but they are not necessarily incentivized to participate in the credit economy, which uh, we refer to uh, as the academic paper, um, I don't want to say paper mill, but sort of, yes. Uh, we, academics get measured in how many papers they published and where. Um, and team infrastructure roles do not necessarily directly uh, write these academic papers. However, um, they do play a structural role in the research process. And that's why we went for the, team, for the name team infrastructure roles and not just team roles or um, uh, something else because they are structurally part of the research process. And we wanted to stress that. There's many benefits to these types of roles in research. Uh, you can utilize increased specialized expertise because everyone can specialize in whatever they are best at. That will allow you to tackle more complex research challenges. This will hopefully lead to more diverse perspectives contributing to research, maybe not necessarily, but it allows for um, more diverse perspectives contributing. And I would argue that in the end, that will lead to more productivity uh, in the research process and also the outcomes. So lots of benefits. Um, also a couple of challenges that we see, apart from the challenge that I already mentioned uh, from, um, are these people researchers? Um, we see that these roles deal sometimes with a lack of autonomy because their job descriptions are uh, more strict in comparison to researchers. They have limited formalization of career pathways. There can be prejudice against uh, their roles or activities, career choices, because sometimes they're seen as leaving uh, academia. And it can also be difficult in some situations to recognize their contributions to the research process, uh, because some of it can be quite invisible if you only look at the academic paper. And in the preprint, we describe uh, a couple of pathways forwards. And first, we would like to focus on the research process and not necessarily the outcomes. Um, outcomes are very important, but if we are going to focus on them, then it should be broader than just the article. And it should include data, software, uh, presentations for the public, uh, citizen science, etc., uh, and not just the research article. And that also requires a more expansive system for recognizing contributions. So we argue that credit is a great start, um, but again, if a contribution doesn't lead to authorship on an article, it is not of much help, unfortunately. So we really need to expand this contribution uh, system. Then we also argue that if we're going to expand the system in terms of outputs, uh, then we'll also need to um, expand the system in terms of validation, because then there's data sets, um, software repositories out there. And that is actually where team infrastructure roles can play an important role in doing uh, peer review and improving and validating research outputs. And they are expert in their own rights in this. And then uh, I've mentioned a lack of uh, standardized pathways or career uh, roles in this type of um, roles. So therefore, we would propose to um, more standardize these roles and pathways. And we highlight the research software engineer as a good example uh, of how that can be done. 
Um, then, if you've now heard this talk and you're thinking, uh, wow, that actually describes what I'm currently doing and I am dealing with similar problems, uh, we would actually really like to hear from you. Uh, the Turing Way has a chapter on research infrastructure rules describing case studies, um, what it is that they're doing in their daily and weekly lives. Uh, and for example, we have research software engineers, uh, research application manager. Uh, my own role is described as well as with a case study, if you'd like to learn more from what I am up to. Uh, and we are very happy to hear from you uh, and you can contribute your role, your case study to the Turing Way uh, via uh, well, you can contact me or you can go to the Turing Way and find the contributing guidelines uh, and contribute your experiences directly to the Turing Way. So please do that. And in sum, um, I, what we want to really highlight is that focusing uh, on papers alone on, in the research ecosystem is not um, beneficial. Instead, we need to focus on processes and broader contributions and this will not only benefit those working in team infrastructures, but we argue the wider research ecosystem. Because as Kirsty Whitaker has already said uh, at AI UK a month ago, uh, we basically can't expect individuals to be able to perform all the tasks of academia to the highest standards. Uh, we are unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, not unicorns. Uh, and what we would like you to think about is how we can make this system um, so that diverse roles are actually truly seen as integral participants in research. And they're not wondering whether they are actually a researcher. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, particularly thanks to the team infrastructure role team, uh, the Turing Way, OLS and the wider open science communities who make this type of work possible, and also the Turing Way illustrations uh, by Scriberia, which you can freely reuse uh, because they're released under a CC BY license. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther, for this beautiful presentation. I think it's so important. It resonates with me so much, this element of we should value the research process and not only the outcomes of it, there are many things that go into preparing a paper at the end of it, so why don't we just surface all of that? Fantastic, thank you. Again, a reminder that if you have any questions or comments uh, for Esther, feel free to post in the chat and we'll come back to, it, to that. And now I'm going to uh, hand over to the second speaker in this session, Sarah Lippincott. Sarah is a librarian and library consultant with wide expertise in uh, open access, but also supporting digital scholarship and scholarly communications. She's currently the head of community engagement at the data repository Dryer, where she was with institutions, funders, and researchers to increase, increase awareness of and engagement with data sharing and data reuse. And she's going to be telling us more about that just now. So over to you, sir. Thanks so much, Yerache. Um, right. Can you see my, uh, my slides? Uh, not yet. Not yet. It says double click to enter. Oh, sorry, no, this is for my setup. Um, Let's see. Let me try that once more. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it says it, it does tell us you have a start the screen sharing. I don't know if it may be. A, um, okay. You yeah, it's telling me my screen sharing is paused. I'm not sure why. Why that would be. Um, let's see. Oh, it's, com it's coming up now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, it Excellent. took a bit. All right. Go ahead. All right, apologies for those technical difficulties. Um, uh, I am Sarah Lippincott, Head of Community Engagement at Dryad, and my talk describes our efforts to connect global communities through open data publishing. 
Dryad is an open international data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. And our vision for data publishing is the widespread adoption of best practice data publishing at no cost to scientists embedded in workflows of researchers, connecting them to their global research communities. Since our founding in 2008, we've curated and published nearly 50,000 data sets representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. And our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 leading academic journals. We were founded as a home for data underlying published research with the notion that an independent non-specialist repository can serve as shared infrastructure for a large and diverse set of journals to help them realize their data sharing goals. Dryad continues to occupy a unique position as an independent, non-specialist hub, connector, and invigorator of open data, bringing diverse communities into conversation with thousands of data sets. We now help publishers and institutions serve local or community-specific needs for trustworthy, standards-based data curation and publishing while, benefit while benefiting an international community of researchers and supporting a global fabric for data sharing and reuse to advance scientific discovery. Our recently announced partnership with AAAS and the Science Family of Journals is a great example of this. In their editorial announcing the partnership, the editors of Science reminded us that science is a social process and that discoveries do not become knowledge until the findings are shared with the scientific community to be vetted, challenged, and expanded upon. Science, uh, the science journals have been exceptionally successful um, in incentivizing authors to deposit data. They report nearly three quarters of their authors shared data in public repositories in 2020. And they found that a primary challenge was when authors could not identify a specialist repository. Dryad provides a home for that data, providing a reliable standards-based solution that makes it easy for researchers to follow data sharing and archiving best practices when a specialized repository isn't available. We support data that might otherwise languish on personal devices, in commercial cloud storage, or other silos, and make it available for the social process of science. The idea of science as a social process also reminds us that data is a living asset, a part of a scholarly conversation that exists to be interrogated, validated, and built upon. Further, it reminds us that research communities themselves are not static, not necessarily bounded by traditional disciplinary designations um, and, and not necessarily, um, and, and are, are ever evolving. From a repository perspective, our technology and our workflows should enable various forms of reuse within various research communities, from reproducing and replicating findings to repurposing data to generate novel insights, building upon previous research, whether within the same domain or, or across domains, uh, performing meta-analyses, and even seeding machine learning algorithms. Reuse may follow a, a, a typical process of, of replication or validation of research results, or it may, may be a, a novel and creative and, or serendipitous um, uh, application of data sets uh, for a, a completely different use case within another community. At Dryad, we enable reuse in a number of ways. We ensure quality through a hands-on curation process that evaluates metadata and data files to ensure they're suitable for sharing, that metadata provides sufficient context for interpretation, and that data files can be open and understood. Our curation process is one of the key elements that differentiates data publishing and data depositing or archiving. It's the ad added value we provide to institutions and publishers who want to support the process of open science and not just to enforce uh, compliance with mandates. We also integrate with other scholarly infrastructures to maintain and create connections between different research artifacts and different research communities. We provide a seamless conduit to depositing code and supplemental information associated with a Dryad data package through our partnership with the open access repository platform Zenodo. And we integrate directly with major manuscript management systems, giving journals the opportunity to facilitate deposit of data into Dryad at the point of manuscript submission. 
Persistent identifiers play a key role in, in how Dryad facilitates these connections as well. Dryad metadata incorporates a range of persistent identifiers, including ORCID for research, researcher names, research organization registry IDs for affiliations, Crossref funder registry uh, IDs for granting organizations, and of course, we attach a digital object identifier through data site to every data set um, that are separate from those used to identify any associated research article. Um, a central context for interpreting data can also come from related research artifacts, including software and code, research articles, preprints, other data sets, and data management plans. Dryad encourages authors to add persistent identifiers for these outputs as well, directly linking a data publication and its network of upstream and downstream research artifacts. In this instance, you can see how Dryad is bringing uh, it's uh, the data set deposited with us into com conversation with a data set deposited in a specialist repository, as well as a published research article that describes the interplay uh, between these two data sets and the resulting analysis. Dryad provide, is providing a hub that makes all of this crucial context available to the next researcher. This metadata made available through our API makes it possible to provide robust context and build programmatic connections between a data set its creators, funders, and related outputs. Even after publication, we programmatically harvest citations to the data set to continue building these connections and adding con uh, context over time. And we, to, to quote our collaborator, Ted Haberman, we recurate data. Uh, metadata requires care and feeding. Practices change over time, new standards emerge, um, new persistent identifiers become available. And so Dryad therefore recurates our metadata long after publication. For example, um, we predate the research organization registry. So when research organization registry IDs became available, we not only began systematically including them in all new submissions, but retroactively applied them to our entire corpus. As an international uh, interdisciplinary data platform, we face inherent tensions between supporting generalizable metadata curation processes and interfaces that can apply across domains while attempting to support robust discovery and reuse, which typically benefits from, which often benefits from the discipline specific metadata schemas, expert review, and built in tools for visualization and analysis that some specialist repositories offer. We're actively working to address this challenge to leverage our interdisciplinary international platform to, to best support data discovery and reuse. And I'll be curious to hear any thoughts you have to share on, on that challenge and that tension. If you have any questions that I'm not able to answer during the session, please reach out to me at sarah at datadryad.org. And you can explore over 50,000 open data sets ready, for, ready and licensed for reuse at datadryad.org. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this overview of Dryad and all, all the important um, activities that you're doing as many other repositories to support the, the infrastructure and the visibility as well and connection with other outputs between data sets and, and, and again, the work of researchers. Thank you so much. Uh, right, our third presentation uh, for today is going to be led by two co-speakers, uh, Rachel Lamy and Helena Cushing. Um, Rachel is the Director of Product at Crossref, where she leads the organization's approach to community-focused product development, consulting with members, users, and other infrastructure providers to help focus Crossref's priorities. Helena is the Director of Communication at DataSite, where she's responsible for DataSite's membership and community activities, and she also drives data science mission by enabling of enabling data sharing and reuse and she's passionate about data citations so i'm gonna hand over to them Go yeah ahead. thanks a lot iracha um so yeah as iracha said hi i'm helena uh data Science director for community engagement and i'll be pre presenting together with my colleague rachel lemmy who's uh, Crossref's product director. I realize it's a lot to have two speakers for a lightning talk, but we'll try to keep it short so that there's still uh, some time for questions. Um, so Rachel and I, we are the co-chairs of uh, the RDA Scolix working group uh, together with Paolo Mangi from OpenAir and Lorenzo, Lorenzo Ferri from Elsevier. Um, and so today we briefly want to tell you a bit about Scolix, which is 
what I will do, and after that, we uh, Rachel will tell you a bit about our ideas to expand and apply Scolix uh, to software. Um, so yeah, let me start uh, with what Scolix actually is. Um, maybe some of you haven't heard of it, and I guess also if you have heard of it, I think there's sometimes a little bit of confusion about what it actually is. So Scolix is a framework. Uh, Scolix stands for Scholarly Link Exchange, and it's a framework that was developed by uh, the RDA WDS Scolix Working Group. Um, that group was actually founded quite a long time ago, and the framework was already launched in 2016. So this is not a recent um, development, but the group is still active and uh, we're still working on expanding uh, some of these activities. And so Scolix is a framework for standardizing the exchange of scholarly inf link information between scholarly infrastructure providers. And it currently has a focus on articles and data sets. And so uh, the problem that Scolix uh, or the working group was trying to solve when we started working on this was um, that linking between research data and articles is of great value, but often these connections are not established or when they're established, these connections are not available. Uh, so the problem was that there were many disconnected sources and also a heterogeneity of practices with the PIT systems, with the ways of citing and referencing data. And so at the time when this work started, um, some connections were being uh, established, but that was done bilaterally. So for example, between one publisher and one repository, they were exchanging information. Uh, they had about links between articles and data sets, but this was not available to the broader community. Um, so what we then did with Scolix was set up a set of guidelines to actually exchange that information to make it available to the uh, wider uh, research ecosystem, um, and also to provide organizations with a method to do that. Um, and so um, to enable that exchange of information, uh, we're working through a number of hubs. And so for example, for publishers, that hub is Crossref. And when publishers have information uh, about a link between an article and a data set, they can just add that to their Crossref metadata. And the same for data centers and repositories, when they register uh, a DOI for a data set with data site, um, they can add information about uh, a relationship um, with an article to the metadata there. And also, for example, OpenAir um, is, is a hub within the framework and uh, you can contribute links through OpenAir. Um, and so as part of the framework, we put together sort of a simple metadata schema that describes the information that you need to provide um, as part of the framework. And so there are there's information related to the source object that you provide and information related to the target object. And then very importantly, also uh, the relationship between these two objects. Um, so there are different types of relationships that you can indicate. So for example, um, from let's say the data set perspective, you could say this data set is referenced by this article and put that in the, in the data set metadata. Or for example, from an article perspective, you could say this article is supplemented by this data set and is related to is a somewhat more generic relation type. Now, I think this is all reasonably well established. I mean, there could, adoption could always improve still, but I think um, in terms of how we exchange the information, we're all in agreement that this is a good way of doing it. Um, so the last couple of years, we started thinking, okay, we have a framework uh, that can be used to exchange information about the connections between articles and data sets. Uh, but what about other research outputs? In a way, uh, this framework is already used for other research outputs. So could we formalize that more and, and provide more explicit guidance? And so what we've been thinking about specifically is how this can apply to software. And so that is what... Uh, Rachel with, will uh, will share with you now. So Rachel, over to you. Cool. Um, thank you. So 
She said, we, the reason for looking at software is because within the, the information that we share between organizations, Crossref, Data Site, Open Air, we make openly available, we were seeing a growing number of links being established already using the, the Scolix framework and those relationships that Helene has explained between articles and, and software. So you can see some figures from Crossref, Open Air. I think the, the next slide shows um, similar growth um, in the data site metadata. So um, growing amount of those links and we felt like um, we had some conversations about using Scolix to be able to, to officially acknowledge these links and be able to support them in a standard way. Um, by using an existing framework rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Next slide. Again, as said, we're already also seeing this from a Crossref perspective in the metadata our members register with us. And we're also seeing software being cited in reference lists and also um, you know, in specific data and software um, availability statements in journal articles. So again, you know, we're we want to be able to support the direction of travel that our community is is our communities are already taking. Next slide. And also, you know, in terms of the direction that the community is already taking, um, we know that um, Force Eleven have been working in software citation for for some time, and we've been talking to. Um, that various sort of stakeholders who've been involved with that work to, to sense check our thinking. Um, so again, you know, the, this work doesn't exist in a vacuum and we want to, to make sure that the, the, the recommendations that we're making are compatible with other recommendations and have, have, have the, the buy-in and the expertise of, of folks who are already working in this area behind them. Next slide. So it said we started to discuss that there'd be value, value in expanding Scolix and basically to acknowledge that you know software is a first class output of the of the research process. You know, we've I think there's broad acknowledgement that um we are a article an article centric view is is a thing of the past. Specifically, the recommendations. So we've added um, the type software to the to the schema, um, and we're also um, we'll also plan to add a, a field for version so that um, so that folks are able to see which version of the the software is being cited, which can obviously help with acknowledgement and reproducibility. Helena's has talked about the um, links between. Um, that are established in the relationship metadata. And again, we'd always, um, we want to keep those kind of consistent. Um, it's supplemented by references, is version of, um, but to give recommendations as part of the work so that people can use those consistently. We see people using um, different relation types for different things. So we want to kind of back these up with guidance for the community um, as well and, and to kind of sense check those. Next slide. So the next steps for us, um, we want, we're continuing to sort of validate this with different stakeholder groups while we're here today, publishing a new schema version on Zenodo for, for feedback. Again, that should happen in the next week or so. Um, and also then, you know, if after that contacting RDA about endorsement of the updated schema. And we've got a longer webinar in a few weeks time um, supported by RDA to again, to welcome discussion, feedback, et cetera, on this important topic. So thank you for your, thank you for your time. And we'll drop our contact details into the, the chat in case you've, um, in case you want to get in touch outside the scope of this, um, this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen and Rachel. Uh, and I see that there have been a few questions posted on the chat, so I invite the speakers, if you would like to engage to the chat as well, feel free. Um, right, so our next speaker is Wendy Wong. Wendy is the research data librarian at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and she's responsible for developing the research data service at the university, as well as uh, responsible for promoting open science and open data. 
Over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much, Iris. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, um, I'm Wendy, research data librarian from the University of uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong Library. And the topic of my presentation today is research data service as CHK from collaboration to foundation. Uh, thank you for giving me this chance to report our recent developments. While we search data management, RDM is of growing importance internationally in recent years. The Chinese University of Hong Kong CUHK set up a task force on RDM and started its discussion across campus in 2019 for developing related services. After four years of collaboration with different units, and experience sharing with institutions around the world. We have established a solid service for our CUHK community. This lightning talk aims to share the process of our development and the importance of collaboration for the foundation of the service to promote open access and data management principles. After the establishment of the task force in 2019, the Committee on Research Data Management was set up in September 2020 under the Research Council of CUHK. Its members comprise representatives from the Research Council, the faculties, and professional and administrative services units, such as the graduate school, the university IT departments, the library and the knowledge transfer office. We developed the CHK guidelines on RDM. It covers not only our best practice suggestions for data life cycle, but also the worldwide acknowledged fair data principle. With also the open access initiative and the forthcoming grants application policy on RDM from the University Grants Committee in Hong Kong, Researchers at CUHK who are now aware of research data management is continuously growing. Our infrastructure also translates the international efforts into our local setting. We have deployed our CUHK research data repository with Dataverse, an open sourced software developed by Harvard University, and the DMP service with DMP2, which is supported by University of California Correction Center, UC3. Our CUHK research data repository was soft launched in late 2021 and fully launched a year after. This is our landing page. We target to build our rep repository with the trust data principle, trust data repository principle, and which in the future we can be certified on this. CUHK members can now log in to deposit data sets by themselves in their personal folder in the inside their departmental folder. For example, this is a data, this is a folder for the School of Life Science and the, uh, the professor can develop his own folder and inside it, he can further develop project folders and de uh, deposit data sets inside it. During the setup of the repository, we are glad to have the support from our university IT department, the Dataverse Working Group, and its community. We are also grateful to learn from the experience from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, a local institution, as well as other overseas institutions like Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and Johns Hopkins University. We have customized the Dataverse largely to model to a model that fits our use. For instance, the login process and the user interface. The support from DMP2 also provides a platform for CHK members to create data management plans. We tailor-made the CHK DMP templates and ingested it into the DMP2 platform. The ongoing updates and developments on this DMP2 reflects the current need of researchers to link DMPs with open data deposited in our CHK research data repository. On this slide, it shows how users can indicate their 
intended repository using the CHK Research Data Repository and link the DOI of their research outputs in the DMP. As for trainings on RDM, the library provides different guides on research data management, including the general RDM guide. And from this guide, you can, it can be linked to further DMP guide and a specific guide on our CHK research data repository. Users can search RDM CUHK on search engines and they will be directed to all the guides. Our library offers a series of RDM workshops to the larger CHK communities as listed here, ranging from data literacy, research data management, which emphasize on um, open data, data management plan writing, and the use of our data repository. We also co-organized customized seminars with the Knowledge Transfer Office faculties and departments. Furthermore, with the graduate school at CHK, we offer live workshops and self-training materials for postgraduate students. Some trainings are mandatory as guided by the Graduate Council. These are some photos from our library workshops and workshop co-organized with other unions. Recently, the University Grants Committee in Hong Kong is also providing online RDM trainings to researchers in Hong Kong with the support of Digital Curation Center, DCC. We also organize events to raise researchers' awareness of open science, open data, and data reuse. For instance, different departments in our library work together to bring about the idea of Love Data Week, which is an international event in every February. We had workshops hosted by our library staff and faculty members on opening and managing data. The Data Hack event also attracted 11 teams with 51 members to create data analytics projects over a weekend. For now, we have already hosted two cohorts of data analytics practice opportunity to encourage reuse of data by interdisciplinary exploration and promote data mining and visualization. Selected undergraduates and postgraduate students can use data resources available at CHK to create data analytics projects within a five month period. The data could be taken from the CHK Research Data Repository or the CHK Digital Repository. Data visualizations, project websites, and posters are project outcomes for showcasing their works. Faculty members and the CHK Art Museum also provide guidance to our students to de develop their projects. Towards the end of their projects, the students shared their project outcomes in a sharing session in the Love Data Week. The collaboration with different units in the university and the funding agency in Hong Kong promotes the ideas of research data management to researchers in the CHK community. Meanwhile, guidelines and policies that are set up at CHK and in Hong Kong ensure researchers are aware of open data. The experience shared by colleagues from around the world were also vital in the establishment of our RDM service. We are glad that we have such collaboration opportunities which bring forth for a solid foundation of RDM service at CHK, which now serves as an example uh, for other local universities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for this uh, fantastic overview of all the great work you're doing at, at your university to support open data. And again, if anybody has any questions, I see a lot of activity in the chat, which is fantastic to see. If you have any questions for Wendy, do add to the chat. Right. And then uh, we're going to be moving to the fifth uh, and last learning talk for this session. We are going to have two sp speakers for this one as well. Romana Challenge and James uh, Ernshaw. Romana is a library specialist at Flinders University. She has a, a, a fantastic career 
with expertise in information technology, spanning uh, the private sector, uh, nonprofits, and obviously also academia, um, coming from uh, Flinders University. And with her, we also have James, who is a recent graduate looking to pursue a career in information technology. He's very interested in data integrations and statistics, and actually did a, a placement also at Flinders University, looking at thesis, metadata management, and data visualization. So over to you. Okay, hopefully you can all hear me. And wow, it's hard act to follow those previous presentations. They were great. Um, so before I begin, uh, we do a welcome to country or an acknowledgement of country in Australia. So Flinders University acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which its campuses are located. The main campus where we are based is on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. We honour their elders, past, present and emerging. Okay, find the go button. Okay, so my name is Romana and I'm an IT professional now working in the library at Flinders University. My co-presenter tonight is James Earnshaw, who worked on data visualizations in the library as part of his studies, and we're going to co-present on that experience. So as a former academic, I greatly enjoyed teaching. So when we decided to have two students work with us as part of their required work integrated learning placement, it was absolutely fantastic. We interviewed a number of amazing students, but the best were James and Ziwen. And James is obviously presenting with me tonight. It's tonight here, so forgive me for the different time zone. Um, also, while I can, it's James' first conference, so I want to say how proud of, proud of him I am while I get the chance, and he will probably get revenge later for that. So one of the projects I've been working on was evaluating, require, evaluating requirements for a new thesis submission system. One of the things that rapidly stood out in my evaluation was how students were often barely adding keywords and they were not as useful as they could be. Students, after all, are often in a hurry to submit the dreaded thesis and they just want the process over and done with. However, we started wondering about ways to improve that, and one of them was improving keywords with suggestions, which Zwen was responsible for. However, even more excitingly, we thought about then doing visualizations of what the theses were covering to allow students to see what wonderful work was being done and hopefully also motivate the keyword selection a bit more. James, with his IT, maths, and statistics background, was the obvious person to work on these. So what did we aim for? Well, we wanted all the things. When you start a project, you tend to look at all the possibilities. However, the reality is the placement was only 12 weeks and there was no realistic way to achieve all of our goals. So many of these are now on a wish list for any further development and potentially more will projects. So I worked with James and Zwen to establish what they could accomplish, and that led to developing a set of priorities that would allow us to get the most amount of information in the time allocated. We decided with the visualizations that examining the keyword algorithm options available would be the best use of James' time so that we could then move on to implementing the best ones in further projects. So you can see there's a really big list of all the things that we wanted, um, not just visualizations, but frameworks and support for data extraction. And it was a very, very complex project. So I'm going to hand over to James to allow him to explain this process. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh So, uh, hi, I'm James, and I'm here to talk to you about metadata and data visualization. So, as mentioned by Romana, this was a relatively short project where we focused on developing how we use and interact with our thesis metadata. Given that, we focused on what we could practically deliver. We selected and developed extraction algorithms, which can tag a thesis with relevant keywords. 
We would use those to support students through the submission process and to compare uh, the submission process and help improve the labeling of our digital theses. Um, we, ex we, explored the we explored the library's requirements and developed an evaluation matrix to compare options and highlight the ones that best met our needs. And of course, we started mapping our thesis metadata so that we could develop and test our visualizations, creating graphs about our thesis and theses and exploring existing metadata fields. Next slide. So when developing this project, it was important for us to narrow down our most important criteria. These are our initial functional requirements, our guidelines, if you will. You may notice that clarity and accuracy was of the highest importance. The work developing thesis metadata needed to be able to display our data clearly at a glance. And the data visualizations need to be accurate representations of what data we had about theses. Whilst we may not have had sufficient time to take the overall project to completion ourselves, Sue and Sue, my fellow Will colleague, are working on the collection on collection metadata, collecting metadata through a new submission web form, and I worked closely on the database design so that we could support visualizations with accurate data reporting. So these were and are a checklist, if you will, of what library leadership wanted us to prioritize for the thesis metadata. Now I'll discuss some of our artifacts, and I know some of them might look a bit scary, but don't worry, I'll talk you through it. Next slide. Keyword visualizations. So as part of our assessing our design opportunity, we explored how our thesis metadata is currently being utilized. On the left, you'll see a rather, uh, you'll see a distribution of keywords from a random sample of a hundred theses we selected across the colleges. And this is part of our exploratory data analysis to get an idea of how we were currently using metadata. Uh, basically how often do students actually label their thesis? Um, and we did this so that we could compare our thesis metadata with other universities and see what efforts they've been making to support thesis publication and visibility. We also went about finding relevant research on bibliometrics for, res for resources similar to theses and investigating how keyword utilization uh, affected the searchability of those resources and research to support our work on this project. Uh, the graph on the right is an example of a key phrase breakdown of a thesis abstract and is used to try to pull important keywords based on their position in the text. This is one of the methods that we used and explored as a way of extracting keywords from the metadata we already had and about and evaluating that. So next slide. So we did some testing on our keyword visualizations. We tested a bunch of algorithms. We attempted to load sample data from our previous uh, thesis from the previous thesis system to test our visualizations to see what was working and what wasn't. And it was very useful, if not a little uh, interesting. Uh, one of the first graphs I attempted to generate was a thesis apple by college. I assumed six colleges and we had a sample of 100 theses. So I expected we'd at least see 16 theses in each college. We didn't. Uh, it turns out that college was a free text field. And that meant that students were just writing what they thought the name of their college was in that field, leading to a great deal more colleges than we actually had. Um, so this was very important in uh, informing our decisions with future work structuring, how we would manage thesis metadata. Uh, I mapped student keyword code, code utilization here. Um, and you know, student, keyword, student keyword code utilization. It was an important metric to see how our research was linked and how, and how these different theses could be connected to each other to form a greater body of research. Uh, funnily enough, it turns out the anthropologists were really good at using keywords since we managed to relate a lot of their research together through those keywords, whereas some of the other research was a little more sparsely linked. Uh, during processing, we also began to realize that some of the keyword extraction algorithms would take a lot longer than others, and we decided to add time into the mix so that we could reevaluate our criteria and how we process those. Next slide. So we started looking in more detail at our keyword ab abstraction. So once we reevaluated, I was primarily interested in the accuracy of our extractions, which is of high importance. However, the reevaluation allowed me to look at one more medium importance functional requirement. This was time. So we decided that adding performance processing time to the evaluation would be of great benefit to us in, in analyzing that performance. I generated scoring criteria and evaluated the accuracy of the keyword suggestions. You can see that on the left figure. Uh, that's a box plot of the accuracy scores of 
a sample of, I believe, 100 theses tested against all our different combinations of pipeline and algorithms. Um, so scores were developed from Montify based on the agreed sets of criteria uh, for good keywords. We found a few different resources online that showed what the sort of thing guidelines for keywords, and we built our criteria based on that. Um, we also documented the need for further testing and cross correlation for more rigor if we need to expand upon this and do it a bit more formally rather than more of an investigation. Uh, we also compared the time taken for each algorithm and the parameter com combinations. So during the testing, we noticed there was a significant difference in how long different combinations of algorithm and pipeline took. Um, that's on the graph there. We used log two time because there were great orders of difference and we needed to consider how that would affect us uh, how it affects the student experience, since this was a supporting system that was supposed to drive suggestions whilst the student is interacting with the submission process. Next slide. So I collated all these results uh, and all the different evaluations and building and criteria and scoring systems, and I connected it all into an evaluation matrix to just summarize that down for library management. Um, I showed the results in an evaluation matrix um, for the people that would also continue this work. Uh, once my will is over, so they'd be able to make informed decisions and start looking at how they might approach the problem uh, and how they would deal with the things that I've encountered. Uh, so we wanted to show that it wasn't only the algorithm, it was how you combine them that could make a difference in how it functioned. Uh, the resulting matrices focus on accuracy, consistency, and time. So those are our main criteria here, We've got accuracy, consistency. Uh, so that's how well it processed the keywords and gave out acceptable keyword lists. Uh, we also looked at the highest time and the median time, because median time would be our typical user, barring outliers, and the highest time would be how bad can we expect this to be out of 100 theses, interestingly, um, so that we don't have any students thinking that the system might be broken uh, just because of a large wait time and just not interacting with these supporting systems. Um, uh, during the testing, you know, uh, yeah, uh, using, during this process, we were then able to prototype with code and develop visualization scripts and prototypes in Python. Uh, we also built filter extraction prototypes in Python. We built some documentation, some future planning. We outlined things and features that could be explored or utilized as we were developing more projects, such as candidate keywords. Um, and so through that development, we also identified improvements that we made to the database mapping as well. So we were using assumptions about our data source and we were finding that um, there were some conflicts with that, probably due to the long span that thesis had been produced. And we highlighted these as issues to be resolved when migrating to a new system. Uh, uh, and James, sorry to interrupt, but we only have one minute left in this session. Yeah, I think so I'll hand it back to Ramona for a big summary. Thank you. Well, I'm going to cut the big summary short, given that we've only got one minute. Um, basically, we uh, both Ziwen and James came up with some really good recommendations for future work. They eliminated a lot of the preliminary, preliminary requirements um, for exploration, and that means we can now develop on any platform or code base that we decide on independently just by using those algorithms. So having students come and work in the library was absolutely amazing wonderful well thank you so much uh, and again apologies for, for uh, requesting this quick wrap up we are coming to the end of the session i'm sorry that there was no time for questions but i want to thank all of our speakers for great presentations also for the nice uh, timekeeping and and for engaging with the questions in the chat I would like to say, if you have any further questions, know that we have the conference channel on the Slack. So I would suggest that you post that there and invite everyone to join the channel, including the speakers, to continue the conversation in that forum. Um, you still have received the details to join the session just after this. So I'll be transitioning to that because I'm chairing that session too. But um, hopefully, I'll see many of you there too. Uh, and otherwise, I hope to cross also many of you in the future sessions of the conference. Thank you, everyone.